It's an incredible privilege to be here. Uh, and I, I'm not just saying that, I really mean it. Uh, it is a privilege to bring God's word. Um, I said in, uh, in America, it's kind of in uh, Bible preaching training 101. You have to say it's a privilege to preach the word of God. That's the first thing you should always say. But uh, it is indeed a privilege. It's an incredible privilege and it's a weighty, weighty responsibility. And it makes it so much lighter when the guy that goes before you preaches your sermon with uh, your text. And so... Either I've heard the Lord clearly or I've missed Him entirely, you know, just one of the two. Um, I thought I'd introduce myself, just um, tell you a little bit about my journey. And uh, uh, one of the ladies that works with us, she said, Kevin, don't spend too much time in your introduction. Because I, I tend to spend a lot of time with my introduction and then my body, and then I tend to be mid-flight and I can't see the runway. Uh, the guys that are with her this week will know what that means. Um, but I do want to just share a little bit of my story because it is a privilege for me to be standing here this morning. It's an incredible privilege. It's a work of the Lord. I can tell you that much. It is absolutely a work of the Lord. And I get a bit emotional. You'll, you'll just uh, hopefully just indulge me. But about 10 years ago, this journey started with Wilma Ray, who just happened to be doing my sister's wedding. He's a family friend of my brother-in-law. And, um, and he did this sermon. I'm like, this is not only a believer, but a spiritual believer. Praise the Lord. And uh, I immediately connected with him after the service, and we became Facebook, fr Facebook friends. And it was through Facebook over the years that I came to learn of 412 and Andrew and Josh, Jen. And literally, I was a fly on the wall for 10 years, for 10 years. And then eventually, I phoned, I phoned Will, and I said, Will, can we talk some more? Something is stirring in my heart. And from there, and I want to just honor some people. I want to honor Will Marie in his absence today, because I wouldn't be standing here if it wasn't for him. I really mean that, and here's what you've got to understand. I mean, you've heard this before, but most people, everybody that stands on any kind of a platform stands on the shoulders of those who have gone before them. You don't arrive here by yourself. You don't arrive here because you've got an incredible anointing or there's something on your life. You arrive here because God has moved you along where other faithful people have helped you to get to where you are today so that you can accomplish what God has called you to do. You don't do it alone. You don't do it alone. I want to honor some people this morning, just very briefly. Andrew, who uh, I sent him a Facebook message. Eventually, I plucked up the courage one Saturday. And I'll, I will never forget it. And I hate instant messaging on social media. When people send me, I, I ignore them. I'm like, who are you and why are you messaging me? And I sent Andrew a Facebook message. I said, look, you don't know who I am. This is after I'd been talking to Will. You don't know who I am, but um, I just want to, I see you're going to be up to jo in Joburg. He's going to be up in Joburg for a, for a conference um, at Benoni, City on a Hill. And I said, I'd love just to connect with you. And, and I left it. And 15 minutes later, my phone pinged. And Andrew had replied to me. And it absolutely floored me. It really did. You look at his Facebook profile, he's got like 72,000 followers or Facebook friends. And he's got a lot of influence. It's evident. And 15 minutes later, he sends me a message back. He says, I'd love to meet with you. And I, I want to honor you, Andrew, for that. We, we met, and Marnie was there. I wanna, Marnie Lombard, he was just like collateral damage, but uh, you know, he, was, he was part of the meeting. But he was such an encouragement, and I mean that. Such an incredible encouragement. I saw already some of Jesus in these men in a way that I'd not seen it for a very, very long time. And I'm not just saying that. I mean that. And then fast forward, Will connected me with Ryan, and Ryan and I had, I had a lunch, and that sparked something. And then for some strange reason, Ryan just invited me to the 412 Lead Elders time at the end of 2020. We are kind of still in COVID, and I was like, why would this guy invite me into the inner circle? He doesn't know me. He doesn't know my intentions. You never know, bro. <laughs> but he invited me like a brother, and I really mean that. And when I arrived there, I was... I was greeted like I was part of the family. It was unbelievable. It transformed me. And I'm sharing this on purpose. Maybe some of you have been in 412 for a long time. Maybe some of you are new. And I want to share some of my experience so you know that this is real. This is something beautiful about what the Lord is doing in this movement. And in fact, I remember at that first 412 leaders time, I had a kind of like a prophetic word on exhortation. And I remember everyone just looking at me like, Brew, what are you talking about? But I, I said to guys, I said, you have no idea what the Lord is doing in your midst. Like when you look at it objectively, when you come from the outside and you see it with fresh eyes, I'd never seen anything like this before. 
And it was already changing my life. And that, and that weekend, Willem Engelbrecht, Willem, oh yeah, he leads Josh Jen in Grabo. Okay, I'm not, I'm not going to be able to see you. What a legend. Willem had an encouraging word for me. Lee Serafin was an incredible encouragement to me. Chad Laana uh, came over, prayed for me. I did the ugly cry in his shoulders. Uh, it was, you can never undo that moment. I'm still embarrassed today. I think some of my snot is still stuck to his, his neck. But they literally embraced me, literally. Mervis sang over me. And again, honestly, the ugly cry, it's what you, you need to just get used to it, if you're in 412, you'll do it frequently. And you just hope they don't capture that moment and put it on you know, social media, which they did this week, uh, just incidentally. But Mervis just sang over me and blessed me, and I wanna give God praise. Um, I don't want to make too much about 412, but I do want to make a lot about 412 because 412 is all about Jesus. And when you're part of something that makes Jesus everything, he is front and center, then you are safe to give yourself to that. And as someone once said, the church is not a monument, it is a movement. It's a movement, it's not a monument. People love monuments because it's comfortable. Movements are very uncomfortable because you just never know where they're going to go next. And so you've got to hold on to Jesus when you're in a movement. When in a monument, you hold on to all kinds of other stuff. And I'm so deeply grateful to be part of a movement that is proclaiming the name of Jesus Christ in the most beautiful and powerful way. And so turn with me, if you will, to 1 Peter. I know you haven't heard that before, chapter 2. I'm actually going to start a little earlier, and um, I want to read from verse 4. What I'm going to do, I'm just going to go from verse 4 to 9. So the guys have got it at the back. I'm not going to go beyond that. Just from verse 4 through to 9, um, and, and then we'll, we'll make our way from there. So 1 Peter 2, verses 4, and I'm reading from the ESV. It might be slightly different to what you have. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. You yourselves... Like living stones are being built up as a spiritual house. To be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious. And whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become a cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Now, let me just give you a little bit of context, because I think it's important. Um, Andrew did mention this, but Peter, the apostle, and by the way, Peter was known as the apostle of hope, which is incredible. I love that. And the whole book of 1 Peter is a letter written to the saints in the northern part of modern-day Turkey, which is Asia Minor. And they were kind of under somewhat of persecution. They were scattered. They were not in their homes uh, where they grew up. They were forced to move and scatter through the persecution. And so this was not comfortable at all. And as they were living out their faith, following Jesus faithfully, there was persecution and opposition. And what is very challenging for me, if you read 1 Peter, is that Peter doesn't comfort and console them with, hey, man, you can do it. It's going to be all right. All right. The blessing is coming. The blessing is coming. Just hold on. Right? Your ship is coming in. Just hold the faith. On the contrary, despite what they're confronted with, Peter calls him to continue to live holy. Peter calls him to continue to lay down their lives and to follow Jesus faithfully. Peter calls him to hold the line on the truth, to not back down no matter what they're confronted with and how uncomfortable their lives are, Peter still calls them to do that. And he hasn't stopped calling us to do that. 2,000 years later, that's what the Lord is asking us to do. And so this really is something that we can take to heart. I, I think many of us live relatively comfortable lives. Most of us, I would argue. We're not yet in a time of great persecution, but I do want to encourage you this morning. In fact, I want to provoke you. I want to ready you, I think, for a time that is coming where the church will be persecuted. I do think it's going to become uncomfortable. 
I do think that we're going to be challenged and confronted. And we have to be ready. We have to be ready as the church. I want to go to the book of Acts quickly, and I'll jump back to 1 Peter. But turn with me to the book of Acts. And so we have the story in Acts chapter 24. Paul has been arrested, but unjustifiably. He's actually been accused, falsely accused, as they did in the time frequently. He's been falsely accused, and now he's standing before Felix in Caesarea or Caesarea or Caesarea or Casadia, um, however you say it. And so he's, he's being tried in front of Felix, and there is a prosecutor there, Tertullus, who is a snake. And he is hurling all kinds of false accusations at Paul that is actually entirely contrary to what actually went down. So Paul was arrested in Jerusalem for one reason and one reason only, simply because he claimed that Jesus Christ was resurrected from the dead and that we would also be resurrected. And then there was a riot, not caused by him, actually caused by others, and he was arrested. And now he's standing before Felix and he's standing trial. They now falsely accusing him a whole, whole bunch of things. But notice what this prosecutor says, 24 verses 5. For we have found this man a plague, one who stirs up riots among all the Jews throughout the world and is a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. Isn't that a great profile? Isn't that a wonderful description? Imagine they welcome me up here this morning. This guy stirs up riots among all the people throughout the entire Cape Town and particularly Joburg where he comes from. He's a ringleader coming from Gauteng, gangster's paradise, of the sect of the Nazarenes. This is what is said of him, right? Of course, this is not true at all. But notice they have to use false accusations because they can't have actually grab him on what he actually did, which was the truth. He was simply proclaiming what is true. And so they had to go with a false accusation. But notice the description, a ringleader of the sect. Already they throw him into a category. He's, he's part of the sect of the Nazarenes. If we drop down to verse 14, but this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, I worship the God of our fathers, believing everyone laid down by the law and written in the prophets. And so this is Paul speaking, and he's saying, according to you, right, you're saying that I'm part of a sect, but I am someone that is of the way. What is he talking about? Now, I entitled the sermon, People of the Way, because it is a little bit churchy. It's a little bit weird, like people of the way. But I did that on purpose, because it kind of makes you feel a little bit like, Okay? But this is exactly what they're trying to say of Paul. He's part of this weird thing. And we should give no room for this thing to grow or to move forward. And they're using false accusation to stop him. But Paul proudly says, I am of the way. What way is that? Well, what did Jesus say in John 14 verse 6? I am the way, the truth, and the life. We are people of the way. We are people who follow Jesus, and there is something peculiar about us. We are not meant to be normal. We are meant to look like Him. That is what God has called us to do. But what I feel like is when you join a movement like 412, I think a lot of people have a little bit of anxiety, or they, they're uncertain about it because you've heard some stories about these Josh Jen guys. <laughs> Ooh, the Josh, that Josh Jen church. Oh, you know those people, eh? Hey, who's ever heard that? Right? There's, someone said something like that. Right? They're like, oh, are you part of that? Oh, okay. All right, cool. It's good to meet you. I've got to go. And it's fascinating to me that when you have a people who are devoted to Jesus, when you have a people who are a people of the way, there is some measure of kind of almost shame to it that one can feel. Can I just be real? What happened to Peter when they were about to crucify Jesus? Right? And the young girl comes to him and says, hey man, I'm sure I've seen you with that guy. What does Peter say? 
No idea what you're talking about. I'm not with him. Three times he denies Jesus. Three times he's like, nah, don't know him, not with him. Nah, never seen him before. And I realized this, that more often than not, that when you are actually following Jesus faithfully, there's going to be this connotation with it. There's going to be this sense of these guys are over the top. They're too devoted. They're giving up too much. And I'll prove my point. Jesus is walking along. He comes across these guys fishing. And he says, leave everything and follow me. If I'm a family men- member of Peter or Andrew or John, I'm going, guys, who is this guy? Are you mad? Are you following? A- what are you doing? You can't just leave the family business and just follow this guy and go on a camping trip for three years. You have responsibilities. The kids need to get to hockey this week. Who's taking them? Is it just, I, am I the only one that thinks like this? But, but think about, it. the more I read the Bible, the more I realize it's a little weird. Jesus says, if you want to follow me, drink my blood and eat my flesh. I'm out, bro. I'm out. I'm a reformed boy. I'm going to the scriptures going, hold on, let me just see, where is this? But think about it. I, I need you to think about it because it will bring up something in you when Jesus calls you to follow him in the way that people followed him in the Bible, in the way that the disciples followed him. It's gonna bring up something in you, but not just in you, in people around you. They're gonna be uncomfortable with it. But uncomfortable is good you're probably on the right track. If it's comfortable, you're probably not on the right track. Verse 22, one more. Acts chapter 24. But Felix, having a rather accurate knowledge of the way, look at the hypocrisy. Felix, having a rather accurate knowledge of the way, he knew what what, 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 what they were about, sorry, what it was about, what, 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 what I'm going to wrap here. He knew what it was about, but he denies it. Why? Because he's got an agenda. You know why? Because Paul confronted him on some sin. Now, where am I going with this? Listen, there is something happening in the church where people, it's not new, but I think it is gaining momentum, is that the Jesus that the people worship in the churches today is a Jesus that never offends It's a Jesus that will never demand of you something that is sacrificial. It's not a weird Jesus. It's a Jesus that fits into your culture. He fits into your context. He's not going to ask you to do anything that makes you uncomfortable. On the contrary, he will bend his entire will that has been standing for thousands of years just so that you are not offended. And that is the Jesus that people are following. And here's the problem. When you have people like you following the right Jesus, they don't like it. And they won't like it. And then we start wrestling with it. We go, hold on. Is Jesus not meant to be? Uh, People have this view, I think. I had for a long time. If Jesus is the Son of God, if He is God incarnate, if he is the way, the truth, and the life, if he is loving and merciful and kind, if he didn't come to earth with a rescue mission, surely, surely everyone should be running to him. But you're making a wrong assumption. You're assuming everyone wants the truth because you cannot have love without truth. You cannot have Jesus without truth. You cannot have Jesus without justice. And so, no, the whole world is not flocking to Jesus because they don't want him. They don't want him. And can I just say this? This can creep into our own hearts. We no longer want the Jesus of the Bible. This is what is happening in churches. We want a different Jesus. We don't want a Jesus that confronts us. We don't want a Jesus that is Lord, that calls us to lay down our entire lives. We don't want that Jesus. We want a Jesus of our own making. And we have to guard against it because that Jesus fits into the culture. He does. And so he starts to make sense for a lot of people. 
And then people start to deconstruct their faith. Now, I've really come to understand who Jesus is. Yes, but the Bible says, yeah, yeah, no, no, hold on. I know what the Bible says, but I know now who Jesus really is. Let me go back to 1 Peter, if I may. This is where it helps to have um, something in your possession that Andrew had. I found the text much quicker. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, as you come to him. And so the question is, who is the him that you're coming to? Which him are you coming to? Who are you coming to? Who do you want? Who are you pursuing? A living stone rejected by men. Isn't that astonishing? This Jesus, this amazing Jesus, who's supposed to welcome everybody and anybody, this Jesus who's just love, 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 was rejected by men. They did not love him back. Rejected by men. But in the sight of God, chosen and precious. And that, that's all that matters. In the sight of God, chosen and precious. He goes on to say, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house. He's obviously making the connection. Why is Jesus the living stone? Because of the very thing that Paul was arrested for. Because of the resurrection. Because he claimed the truth about who Jesus was. He is the resurrected Christ. He overcame sin and death. And if he is the resurrected Christ, then he stands above it all. Then he gets the final say. Then we get to bow down before him, worship him, follow him, lay down our lives before him and give ourselves entirely to him. And people do not want to do that. You want to solve sin in your life, you put Jesus in his right place. As someone once said, we worship our way into sin, we must worship our way out of sin. What do they mean? We worship, sin is really just worshiping of idols. We create idols and we worship them and that idol makes promises and we bow down to it. We pay homage to those idols and we give of ourselves to those idols and we do what that idol demands. And if you want to get out of sin, you need to take your worship off your idol and put it back on Jesus and worship your way out of sin because you do truly realize Jesus is all you need. He is the only one worthy of our worship, but yet he himself was rejected. So what makes you think you will not be rejected? I think as a movement, we'll be rejected by many. I think persecution will come because you hold the line on truth, because you're following the Jesus of the Bible. Persecution is going to come. It will come. And if not from out there, from within your own home, you're going to be at odds even with family members, with friends, with colleagues maybe. You're not going to see eye to eye on things. The question is, what are you looking at? Who are you following? Because the Jesus that you claim to follow was rejected by man. Why? Because he held the truth. He was the truth. And they crucified the truth. People don't want the truth. They don't. And if we were to be honest, we don't always want the truth. And we need the Spirit of God to shift our hearts, to change us, to transform us so that we desire the truth. But I tell you what, when you desire the truth and you encounter the truth, then that scripture that says you will know the truth and the truth shall set you free becomes real. You taste and see that the Lord is good. You experience the power of God through the truth of His Son, Jesus Christ, in a way that radically transforms you. And it doesn't have to make sense. You don't have to wrap your mind around it. You just have to trust Him. You do have to trust him. I think many people get stuck because we try and wrap our mind around things. If I can comprehend this and understand it and work it into the culture and figure out how this is meant to work, then I'll accept it. And when I accept it, I'll take some time to maybe, maybe begin to act on it. I read a great quote many years ago, which I can't remember, which is sad. I hope the Lord brings it back to me at some point. It must have been a meme. I'm joking. But it was this, 
People are waiting to understand the word before they obey it. If you just started obeying the word, you'd probably understand it. The more we obey the word, the more we trust him, the more we follow him, the more we'll understand it. The more we'll experience him if you just trust him and obey him and follow him faithfully. This is what Jesus did, and Jesus was crucified. So we can expect opposition as people of the way. You can expect to be labeled as a sect. And you must check. It's important. It's kind of important, right? You can't just be caught up in a movement or momentum or hype or whatever it is. You have to have your own resolve and your own conviction that lines up with Scripture and look at this thing and go, does this thing line up with Scripture? Is this the will of God? That's on every single one of us to make sure that we're not just caught up in something, but that you have your own resolve and your own conviction before the Lord and that it lines up with the Word of God. That's on you and that's on me. But the more I get to be a part of this beautiful family, the more I get to see people who take this thing seriously. I don't think I've ever been at a 412 meeting or a Josh, Tan, a Josh, Josh Jen meeting or a City on a Hill meeting where I haven't been convicted. I, I'm not exaggerating. Not one single time, I don't think. Every single time. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house. Every single one of you, a living stone. Why? Because of the resurrection of Christ. God is at work in you. I, I know you don't always believe it. Sometimes I doubt it. I do. Sometimes I doubt it. But you are a living stone. And God is building you up. He's actually building you up. And He's building you up individually, but He's building us up collectively. Because individually, you're the temple of the Holy Spirit. He dwells within you. That's an astonishing thought to think that God himself has made you his dwelling place, but he also dwells within us. And it's the we and it's the me. It's all of us together, but it's, you're an individual. And you are a building stone, a living stone that God is using to build a temple for his glory and for his purposes. And every single one of you is necessary. Every single one of you. If you're a living stone, then you're part of this great house of the Lord. There are no exceptions. So maybe you don't feel that way, but the scriptures teach us clearly that you are a living stone being built up as a spiritual house, that he is building you up. He goes on to say to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. We have a purpose in being living stones, a holy priesthood. Andrew spoke about that already, but one of the powerful things as priests that we do is that we minister to one another. God has called us to hold one another accountable, to love one another, to journey with one another so that we can help one another become the building stones that he has called us to be. Every single one of you have a mission to minister to people around you to be a part of what God is doing in their lives so that they can become everything that God has called them to be, so they can accomplish everything God has called them to accomplish. That's why I'm standing here today. Living stones around you, pouring into you. A friend of mine put it this way. They said, Christianity is nothing more than a bunch of people helping one another home. But it's more than that, actually, is helping one another to become everything that God has called us to be. He's purchased us with a price. We are precious to him, as Andrew said earlier, is what the text says. And that precious means he looks at you and values you and sees you. It's one of the most powerful things about the message of the gospel is that God can look at anybody. I don't care what your background is. I don't care how debaucherous it has been, I don't care how broken you are, God can look at you and see value, worth, and significance and call you to himself and call you into much more than you could ever possibly imagine. He will make you a living stone and not only that, he will use you as part of this glorious and wonderful building that he's building for the sake of his own glory and his own purposes. Verse six says, for it stands... 
in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Now, the cornerstone is necessary in order for the entire building to be built correctly. We are people of the way. We are not people of our own way. We didn't gather you over this weekend to help you or to, to come alongside you and to equip you to accomplish everything that you desire to accomplish. That is not the point of church. And many churches, I think, make it the point that God is about helping you to accomplish what you want to accomplish, to build the life that you want to build. On the contrary, God is calling you to be a part of something that he is building. God is calling us to lay down our lives so that we can be part of his eternal purposes. And every single one of us have a place. Every one of us is a living stone, part of his eternal purposes. And that is why we are here to be equipped as the body of Christ, so we can be available and equipped to do what God has called us to do for his purposes and his glory. Verse 7, so the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Isn't it interesting that the one whom we follow is the one who was rejected by the builders? And that doesn't always make sense because in the culture that we live in today, Andrew's like, with the celebrity culture, why do people love celebrities? Because other people love them. And I want to be photographed with someone who's loved by many other people. They're not really loved, but that's the presumption that is made, right? But are you willing to follow someone that is rejected? Are you willing to follow someone that is not known? Are you willing to someone follow someone that is marginalized but is doing the right thing? That is the question. Jesus himself was marginalized and ultimately crucified for doing what the Father had asked him to do. And if you come into a movement where people are doing what God has asked them to do, they may very well be rejected and marginalized. Will you still follow them? Will you just still be a part of what God is doing, even though that is your experience? I would hope that it's a yes. But I want to encourage you with this. We were singing a song earlier, you're the treasure in the field and I give everything. And I was wondering about some people that might be struggling to give everything. Maybe you're struggling to live that out, to actually devote yourself to that degree, to give everything. And the encouragement came from the Lord is quite simply this. Number one, you are able to give everything. I don't think people believe that they can do that. I don't think people actually believe that I could give everything. Yes, you can. If the Lord has called you to give everything, then you can give everything. And if you're not able to, he's able to change that. If you're not willing, Lord, I'm not willing, but I'm willing for you to make me willing. The Lord can transform and change your heart to bring you to a place where you're willing to lay it all down. And that is what he's calling us to do, nothing less, because he's worth it. He's worthy of it. I want to jump back to verse 7. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. We build with him as the cornerstone. Everything has to be aligned with who he is and what he has said in your life personally, but also in the body of Christ. See, the greatest thing that we should fear is not failure. The greatest thing that we should fear is succeeding at what doesn't matter. <clears throat> and how many of us can build lives or build churches or build ministries that don't matter because it's not aligned with the cornerstone. You don't want to get to the end of your life and realize it didn't matter. And Paul here in 1 Peter paints a picture of something that is to come. He actually anchors the saints, their hope, in a future event that hasn't yet happened. And as Christians, we have to live with an eternal promise, an eternal promise that Jesus will return. The stone that was rejected, who is now the cornerstone because God has chosen him, will return triumphantly for his bride. He is coming back. And we will stand before him one day. And we will share in his glory. And we will share in the honor that he will receive. That is what God is calling us to. But you won't do it unless you're willing to lay down your life this side of eternity. 
You won't do it unless you're willing to follow him no matter the cost. You won't do it unless you follow the Jesus of the Bible. The one who was rejected. I think God is going to empower us by his spirit. We don't do this on our own steam. This is a work of the Lord. This is not a work of man. No amount of rah, rah can get you to lay down your life for Jesus. It is a work of the spirit. But here's a greater challenge. Some people, I think many people be willing to die for Jesus. The question is, are you willing to live for him? We should be living every day in this space for the glory of the one who has redeemed us. We are the people of the way. That's who we are. That is your identity. That is who you are. You've been chosen by the Lord. That is who you are. Would you believe it this morning? That's the question. Would you believe it with all of your heart? And if you don't quite believe it, would you ask the Lord to change your heart? Would you trust the Spirit to shift something in you so that you would actually believe it, so that you can be the living stone that God has called you to be and be a part of what God is building for His own glory and His own purposes? I want to finish with this. A prayer that I'd like to pray for you guys, but it really is a call to action first. And I want to make a call to every single person in this room And here's the call. And this is not a call from me. I think it's a call from the Lord. Will you stand? Will you stand for the Lord? Will you draw the line? Will you hold the line? Would you proclaim his name and his excellencies in the way that you live your life? Would you follow the one that was rejected by man? Will you be willing to be rejected yourself as you follow him? Would you be willing to lay down your life Are you willing to make a stand is the call to every single one of us. And I want to say this. The more I say yes to Jesus, the more I'm absolutely overwhelmed by his grace and his goodness. The more I say yes to Jesus, the more he accomplishes in me and through me. The more I say yes to Jesus, the more I'm astonished at his purposes and his plans. So can I ask, can I I pray that that be okay, Andrew? So here's the call. If that's you and you want to make a stand, and you'll say, yes, Lord, I want to be part of the people of the way. They can call me all kinds of things, right? They can reject me. They can oppose me. They can ridicule me. But I'm going to follow Jesus. I'd love for you to stand. Andrew shared this quote earlier this morning. It was literally in my notes, but it, I'm going to repeat it. It's, um, God does extraordinary things through ordinary people. That's a fact. He does extraordinary things through ordinary people. And people don't become extraordinary when God does extraordinary things in them and through them. He still remain ordinary. He remains the one that is extraordinary. But I never thought the Lord would want to use me in this way. And I was saying, this is not the pinnacle of what the Lord is doing in my life. This is not it. Like you've arrived because you've got lights on you, you can't see anything. And, you know, you feel like a celebrity because of the lights. It's not the pinnacle. If I think of where the Lord's brought my life from and what He's done, that's all He's doing. All of it. But he does need a people that will say, yes, Lord. He does need a people who are willing to pay a price. That's his desire, and it's an invitation to you. And I want to say it's an invitation that he can make, because by the Spirit of God, you're able to do it. I promise you this, that if you surrender and yield to the Spirit, You'll do far more than you could ever possibly think. And I mean, this is how I mean this. You'll pay a much higher price than you could ever, you ever thought you would ever pay. For the sake of His glory and what He's asking you to do. I believe it with all of my heart. I know it to be true. 
Father, I thank you so much this morning for your word. For the Apostle Peter, the Apostle of Hope, his encouragement to us. To follow the one who was rejected, but yet the one whom you chose, the cornerstone. The one who will rule and reign over all things. The one before whom every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. Jesus, our Lord and our King. I pray that you'll work in every heart this morning, Lord. And I ask you, Father, by your Spirit, that you'll shift our hearts, that we would be prepared to be a part of a movement that does require more than we could ever possibly imagine, but it will give us more than we could ever possibly imagine. The privilege of being used for your glory, of being a co-laborer with you, Father God, in your purposes in the earth. I pray that you'll fill every person right now as they stand and make a stand, that you would strengthen them by your spirit in the inner man. That you'll grab a hold of their hearts and give them a conviction and a resolve that they would be prepared to stand alone if they were alone. Because they're not alone, Lord. If we're on your side, even if we are alone with you, we're in the majority. And I pray, God, that we would stand on your side, that we would hold the line, that we would proclaim your name, that we would live for your glory and your purposes, that we would give ourselves entirely and unreservedly, Father God, and that we would trust you and obey you and then have an incredible expectation of what the Lord might do because you are faithful. You are faithful, Lord. So Lord, as you look into every heart, fill every person with your spirit. To that end, in Jesus' name, amen. So um, I'm just going to ask Chad to share um, a, a very short word and then we're just going to come before the Lord and yeah would you share that Jed? So, while, uh, Kevin was closing off I was reminded of a preach that one of our youthies did in our congregation a number of years back and the title of his preach was Fan versus Follower um, Young Kian Achenbach and um, I think it was about 15 at the time, 16 at the time when he preached it with us. Now we just we encourage our, our youngsters to, to rise up. And in that context of going, are we a fan or are we a follower? Because fans will paint their faces, they'll wear the t-shirt, the t-shirt, they might go to the odd game. They'll sh shout from the side, they'll cheer. They'll look at all the others going, yes, yes, yes. But a follower is somebody totally different. A follower is one that is committed to knowing all the players in the team, he's the one that's committed to knowing every, everything about, he's, he's reading the stats, he's, he's going to the next level in terms of his understanding of it. And I just felt in that this morning that the Lord's wanting to call us from a place of fan to follower. That we're not just fans from the side cheering on those and on the shoulders of those that have gone before us, but to actually get in line and go, I'm in this till the last, till the very last breath I have. And so we, there's a clear distinction between fan versus follower this morning as well. That's so good. Thank you, Chad. The young lady, Tracy, brought a prophetic word just before this session started. And she saw that uh, the Lord wanted us to take the idols that are in our hands and, and break them at Jesus' feet. And I think from what Kevin has preached this morning, Jesus is calling us to be people of the way, people who follow Him not people of our own way. And so we're going to sing a song now, but I'd love to ask you to just come before the Lord and just say, Lord Jesus, I want you to be Lord of my life. Lord Jesus, I want to follow you. I want to be a follower of the way, not just a fan. 
Yes, Lord Jesus, all that we are is yours. And we're just going to take five minutes or so. And I just want to ask you to, to bring anything that has gotten in the way of the Lord. Maybe it's, a, it's something that's gotten a higher priority. Maybe it's your, your schoolwork, or maybe it's, it's your business, or maybe it's sport, or supporting a team, or whatever it is. Today, let's just bring it before the Lord, and let's just break it at His feet and say, Jesus, we're yours. Come, let's all just lift up our hands to Him. Let's pray to Him. In our own words, come. Would you come and be Lord again, Lord? Would you come and be Lord of our lives, Lord Jesus? Help us to live, to please you, Lord, to please you, Lord. And I just really feel if there's anyone in this place and uh, maybe you've come as a guest or maybe you've, you've never for the first time given your life to Jesus, I really want to give you the opportunity to join the people of the way. And if you, you, you've heard about Jesus today, you've heard that He is Lord, that, that he, He's called us and He's chosen, and, and that's the truth. He's chosen you. Will you, like, like MC did, respond and say, yes, I want to be yours. And if that's you, I would love to pray a prayer now, and I want you to pray this prayer with me. Let's all pray together. Lord Jesus, I want my life to be yours. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying for me. Thank you for paying the price so that I can come back to God. Today, I want to join the people of the way. Please forgive me for my sins. I give you my life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Great.